Any health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Welcome to Accelerated Health Radio and TV. I'm your host, Sarah Banta. I'm a health coach, natural supplement expert, and a busy mom of three teenagers. And I believe your body wants to and is capable of rebuilding and healing itself regardless of what chronic disease you may have. I'm here for you to answer your questions, bring you innovative and cutting edge technology and health solutions to empower you and your ability to reach your optimal state of health. Today, my guests will be talking about different dietary strategies, including paleo, keto, and ancestral diets, and how they affect your overall mental and physical health. And I know more than anyone that you really need that strong physical foundation in order to work on your mental and spiritual growth. Whatever your health goals are, or your chronic diseases are you're trying to overcome, or just even increasing that level of frequency in life, you need a strong physical foundation of health in order to gain the willpower to make the bigger changes in your life. If you're new to following me, I specialize in helping you get there. You can find my cleanses, my cutting edge natural supplements, devices, and protocols at acceleratedhealthproducts.com. I dive into an array of health conditions, their causes and symptoms, and how to address them naturally. And I've spent thousands of dollars and hours of my time biohacking different supplements, technologies, and diets that don't work. So you don't have to. If you have any health issues you need help with, you can email me through the website. I personally personally read every one. And Accelerated Health Products is the sponsor of this show. So as you support my website, I'm able to bring you more cutting edge content and guests to the show. So as I mentioned, our guest is going to be talking about how to optimize your health through diet which leads to living at a higher state of vib uh, vibration or frequency as a result. So first I wanted to talk about my new monthly free go uh, group coaching that comes with the Accelerated Ascent Diet Cleanse. It's the most comprehensive cleanse I have, and the groups have been reporting such amazing results. Even just yesterday, I got one where the visceral fat had decreased significantly, body fat and decreased, and the muscle maintained, skeletal muscle maintained. Her increased uh, mental and physical energy improved, better bowel movements. People were reporting easily intermittent fasting and fasting from 22 to 72 hours with no problem. And these are people that are used to eating the standard American diet six meals a day. Clearer skin, whiter eyes, better sleep, less moodiness improved cellular health and the ability for the cells to let go of the toxins and absorb the nutrients that you're actually taking in. And in the end, you successfully flush out gallstones out of the body safely. This also gives you a deeper understanding of how to heal the body naturally and an ability to get off those medications that your doctors put you on. The difference between me and any other group coaching is I provide the most cutting edge frequency enhanced supplements that work synergistically with each other and your body doesn't experience those flu-like symptoms and you actually feel great day one. So leave a comment below if you're interested or check it out on the website, acceleratedhealthproducts.com. Now to the good stuff. Rob Wolf is someone I've been following for years. I love his work. He's a former research biochemist and two-time New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat. He and co-author Diana Rogers recently released their book, The Sacred Cow, which explains why well-raised meat is good for us and good for the planet. Welcome, Rob. How are you this morning? Great. How are you doing? I'm great. And for everybody, Rob just moved to Montana for a better quality of life. And but so his... 
is the worst video quality of internet, which right. maybe correlates with better quality of life. And now that we we talked about that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for the audio is great, so that's really all that matters. And you know, any any imperfection on your skin, no one can see, right? <laughs> so there we go. We're doing the Sybil Shepherd like a, a soft phase on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, Rob, why don't you give us a little background on, I mean, you've got a fantastic um, journey that has led you here, but why, why don't we, why don't we start with that? Yeah. You know, by training, I, I did an undergrad in biochemistry and was on a track to either do an MD or a PhD or possibly an MD PhD uh, track, mainly in cancer and autoimmunity research. Uh, I've always had an interest in those areas. And I actually developed a pretty significant health crisis around that time. I had ulcerative colitis at the age of 26, 27 that was so bad that the main suggestion was a, a pretty massive bowel resection. And I knew enough about medicine at that time that although that can save your life potentially in the moment, as can some of the immunosuppressant drugs, it, it, it's not a great prognosis long term. And at the time, I was eating a, a low fat vegan diet, which... Um, also, like I don't, I don't think that that diet would work well for me under any circumstances. But I was also living in Seattle. I had not seen the sun for like two years. I was in a basement apartment. Uh, I, I was living like a jerk when you consider our, our natural rhythms. Like I was getting like three hours of sleep a night and had been doing that for years. So, I. I don't want to overly malign that vegan diet experience. I know some people thrive on it. For me, it was a disaster, but I was a disaster at every turn of my life. You know, I, I looking back, I literally wasn't doing anything right other than just being open minded to the potential that that something else may be beneficial. And it was around this time we actually figured out that the long-standing health problems my mother had experienced uh, were due to an interrelated complex of autoimmune conditions. She had celiac, which is the autoimmune gluten reactivity, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's, uh, uh, just a, a host of interrelated problems. And I was thinking, man, that sounds a lot like what I have going on. And her rheumatologist, through some blood work, suggested that she was reacting to grains, legumes, and dairy. Now, being vegan at the time, the dairy part, I was like, okay, I get it. Don't eat dairy. But um, the grains and legumes, I was just stupefied. I was thinking, what on earth does one eat if you don't eat grains and legumes, you know? And uh, the, again, this was 1998. And I don't know where the term paleolithic diet had gotten into my consciousness, but I, I remember thinking about it and I went into the house and I turned on the computer and waited for it to boot up. And then I had an internet connection probably faster than the one I'm on currently. <laughs> and there was a newfangled search engine called Google. And into Google, I put the term paleolithic diet. And there wasn't a lot of material at that time, but what I found was interesting. It suggested these, uh, these evolutionarily novel foods, <laughs> grains, legumes, and dairy prim primarily, could cause problems for a lot of people. And the main problems that they seemed to cause were uh, gastrointestinal and autoimmune related. There was also kind of a glycemic load issue of just, you know, kind of irregular blood sugar levels, but it made a lot of sense and I was desperate. So I'm about 165, 170 pounds right now at the low ebb of my ulcerative colitis. I was about 125, 130 pounds. So imagine 30 or 40 pounds less of me wow. right now. Like I, I, I was a mess. So I tried a low carb, uh, paleo ish ketogenic diet. And for me, it was a lifesaver. Like it absolutely transformed my life. And it was so powerful and understood it, it quickly on the heels of this, the idea of circadian biology got on my radar and it's like, Oh, I actually do need to sleep or I'm going to die. And, mm -hmm. you know, meditation and stress, uh, mindfulness, uh, appropriate movement, like all of that other stuff got on my radar in pretty quick order. And what it told me was that I couldn't spend another eight to 12 years of my life learning about pathology, you know, via the standard medical route and it, to just get out the end of that and then start trying to practice the type of, you know, medicine or healthcare that I, I was really interested in. So I, I knew I wasn't going to go to medical school. I wasn't even super sure that I wanted to continue along that PhD track. And right around this time, 
uh, continuing to fart around on the internet, I found this kind of wacky workout called CrossFit. And this was around 2000, 2001. And I started uh, working out with a good friend of mine, Dave Warner, who's a retired Navy SEAL. And within, we were working out in his, his garage. And within about three months, we had 15 people that we were training. And we reached out to the Glassmans, the founders of CrossFit. And we said, hey, we, we love what you're doing. We have all these folks that we're training. We want to open a gym formally and we want to call it CrossFit. Can we do that? And they said, yes, go be achieved, do that. And we didn't even have an affiliate agreement for like four or five years. And that was the first CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. I subsequently moved down to Chico, California because it has this fiery orb in the sky called the sun, which Seattle does not have. And uh, I opened what was then the fourth CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. So I had this interesting kind of almost Forrest Gump S experience of just being at the right place at the right time, you know, right at the beginning of the paleo diet movement, right at the beginning of CrossFit. And it allowed me to work with just tens of thousands of people in a whole variety of, of capacities, you know, elite athletes, special operators out of the military. But my passion has always been more folks that have those, um, super complex interrelated metabolic and autoimmune, you know, problems, the, the gut and autoimmune related issues, uh, working with a, an elite athlete is cool, but I, I kind of feel like they're going to be elite no matter what I do. Like my influence isn't really going to change that. But if somebody has, has run the gauntlet of standard medical care and they're still sick, uh, but they haven't considered that some sort of an evolutionary biology kind of approach to their health might be beneficial. Like that might save that individual's life or at mm -hmm. least dramatically improve it. So my um, interest and emphasis has always been more on that, like the, the people that time and medicine forgot and abandoned, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, bring me your unwashed masses <laughs> and all that. And that, I, I've really enjoyed that. And, uh, it, it's, it's been super fun and very, very challenging at, at, at times, but that's, you know, kind of my, my 30,000 foot level story. That's interesting because it's kind of very similar to mine in that I was, I had ulcerated colitis as well, IBS, menstrual issues, acne as an adult, you know, three pregnancies really took it out of me. And it, it, for people like us, we have to hit our own rock bottom to have the passion to do what we're doing. And like you also, I was an athlete and I love the athletic performance aspect of health and supplements and what it can do for you. But I too believe these elite athletes, some of them doesn't matter what they eat or what they do. They're going to be elite athletes and no they're going to survive yep. regardless. They've got superhuman abilities somehow. And yet you might increase their performance by 5% or whatever, but it's the people that are really sick that you see the dramatic changes that are life changing. And through my coaching, I love it because so many, especially women have said, you know, Sarah, this is not a diet. This is not a 30 day cleanse. This is life changing life-changing habits. And you've opened my eyes to what my body actually can do. And that's what is so that feeds my soul and yep. why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, well, it's interesting. You mentioned that through your process, you said you were eating a, a paleo keto low carb diet. Um, was keto even a thing back then? I didn't really hear about it until about 2013, 2015 is when I started really doing keto. I was always low carb. I knew the carbs were not good for me personally, but mm -hmm. just curious. Yeah. You know, it's funny. This stuff goes through kind of cycles. And so before paleo hit the scene, there was Atkins, anabolic diet, metabolic diet, uh, natural hormonal enhancement, which all advocated for a, a ketogenic approach. And then paleo really hit the scene and it kind of occupied all that space. But even in my first book, uh, even though I'm kind of known as like the paleo guy, my recommendation was to start with, a, a you know, adequate protein, about a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass per day, um, keep carbs under. 50 grams, at least in the initial 30 days, and then, uh, fill in fat as per your goals. You know, if you're trying to, to lean out and lose body fat, we need a little bit of a caloric deficit. If you're a hard charging athlete, then you need a lot more calories. So even in that first book, which was released in 2010, I was 
advocating for what was effectively, you know, a ketogenic or periketogenic diet, but it really wasn't in vogue at that time. And, and, right. you know, clearly, uh, maybe two to three years ago, keto was really, really hot. Clearly it, it, it is still to some degree, but you know, we just, we have all these cycles and, and kind of rebranding of, of things. I guess fasting is kind of the, the, the hot topic these days, which, which funny enough, yeah, funny enough, I wrote my first article on intermittent fasting in 2005. And then by 2006, I deeply regretted releasing the, uh, the article because the main people reading it were CrossFit at athletes or CrossFit, you know, disciples. And those folks are crazy. You know, they, uh, they're doing six hard workouts a, a week, sometimes more, um, uh, folks would reach out to me and whether they were male or female, they'd say, Hey, my hair is falling out. I haven't mm -hmm. had a libido in nine months. And, and I, when I would start checking in on them, uh, the, you know, they haven't eaten five grams of carbs in the last month. Um, they intermittent fast, you know, if 16 hours is good, then I'll go 23 hours a day because of course that's, that, that's going to be even better. And so this really type a personality, what I, what I discovered is the people willing to do CrossFit, willing to do intermittent fasting, were also, uh, highly prone to just taking it to the absolute extreme. And so I'm, I'm arguably one of the earliest people talking about intermittent fasting, kind of exploring its therapeutic benefit. And I'm also pretty vocal about uh, a lot of people need to pump the brakes on that. Like they need yeah. the right situation, the right scenario to be able to, to pull that off, you know, and I, I think it has huge therapeutic potential, but I, I see folks going bananas on it and, and kind of, uh, again, thinking that more is better with it. I agree as far as women too, especially, you know, with their cycles and I'm mm -hmm. um, going through perimenopause and menopause and just fertility, all of these things. This is something that I'm learning personally about my own body. Um, I'm a type A personality. You tell me to fast for 16 hours. I'll go a couple days if you told me that that was even better. So I want to take a step back because all of these words are thrown around keto, paleo, low carb, ancestral. Um, can you just break down what the difference is in your mind and I and how you actually can be on a keto, paleo, low carb, ancestral diet, all of them in one. And, um, you know, how, how it also is individual. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, the ancestral health model is this big overarching kind of, uh, umbrella that I use to really ask questions about health. It, it, it's not a place. And this is somewhere that I think the paleo diet movement kind of drove the boat in a, a poor direction because uh, we do still need good science, good research to really get some some granular answers. But I think that from a hypothesis generation perspective, this ancestral health model, it just raises the or, or makes the point that most organisms are very well adapted to the environment that they evolved in. And for humans up until not that long ago, we tended to live in small extended family groups. And this was true, whether we're talking hunter gatherers or even agrarian societies. And it was only within, you know, the, the 20th century that we developed electricity and we had urbanization and people started moving, it, you know, away from their kind of central family units. And we had dramatic changes in our food and kind of the hygiene around us, both good and bad, like public health was good. Getting cholera is a, is a bad day for everybody, but also, mm -hmm. um, there are some challenges there, you know, kids not being raised around animals and, and, uh, being in hyper clean environments appears to have some downsides for immune development and whatnot. Um, the light bulb is maybe one of the most profound changes that we've experienced in the the totality of our, our history, it, it, uh, allowed for all kinds of cool things to happen. Education exploded, you know, uh, uh, movies and TV and all that, but it horribly disordered our, our sleep. And when we disorder our sleep, then we have a tendency to make even poorer decisions around our food. So the ancestral health model is what I use to, you know, if someone is experiencing problems, this is where we start asking why. So if we're dealing with a, a police officer who does shift work and he or she has all these different health concerns, 
yeah, we're going to look at food. We're going to look at a hypervigilant environment that they're in, you know, that, that fight or flight scenario. We definitely need to consider their, their sleep and the disordered nature of their sleep and start thinking about the best ways that we can fix that within a, a very challenging environment. And, uh, in a parts and pieces approach, medicine is kind of aware of these different topics, but using the ancestral health model, it sticks it all together. It really is holistic. Like we must address all of these things in order to get to whatever our, our kind of optimum state is. And then when we start talking about paleo, really for me, it, it's uh, it's talking about food quality. It, it's uh, by inclusion or by exclusion, it's kind of the easier way to do it. We are generally avoiding grains, legumes, and dairy. Um, and so by inclusion, we're talking about meat, seafood, fruits, vegetables, root shoots, tubers. Um, I'm very non-religious about all that type of stuff. Uh, if you want to throw some rice in there and you do well with it, that's great. But the, the paleo model in my mind really is pretty protein centric. It also puts a strong emphasis on, uh, nutrient density. So getting the most nutrition per calorie that we can get. And it's very, very aware of immunogenic foods, you know, some things like dairy and gluten that, that seem to be problematic for a lot of people, soy, some people corn, but that's where the paleo model kind of, kind of fits. It's thinking about food quality. And then when we start considering low carb or keto, then we're really talking about specific macronutrient ratios, you know, keeping carbohydrate below a, a minimum ceiling of like a hundred grams per day. Can you get you into low carb land? Um, somewhere between 30 and 50 grams a day starts getting you close to keto, but it's all super individually driven. Like a 120 pound female is going to have a very different carbohydrate tolerance window than a 260 pound male, you know? And, and so this is where we need to get a little bit granular and get specific about it. And man, the, um, the nearly religious type wars that are waged over these, these, um, what, what should be guidelines, like these should be, uh, you know, rules of thumb to help people get to a spot that then they can start tinkering and assessing. And instead they get written into stone as if they're religious doctrine. And then it's like, no, thou shalt not eat more than 30 grams of, carbs per day. But, you know, we, we find that some athletes can be still in ketosis, reaping the benefits of ketosis, but eating 150, 200 grams of carbohydrate per day, which is half or a third, the amount of carbohydrate they used to eat, right. but because of their physical activity and the amount of muscle mass they carry, this is where they need to work. And if they eat only 30 grams of carbohydrate a day, they will explode. They'll get all the kind of uh, HPTA axis dysregulation, adrenal fatigue, all that type of stuff. And I know I'm jabbering like an idiot now, but this is where we go from very big picture. It's almost like a microscope. Like you can, if you're looking at a microscope slide, you can dial it out to get the, the big picture, but then we also need to dial it in and get that very granular picture to make it specific for folks. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly just within my own family of five. So I've got three kids, teenagers, and they're all athletes. They row crew, which is a demanding sport. And my son, for instance, needs a lot of extra carbs. He's got low body fat and he's working out really hard. And my girls are different. But then you take into the DNA aspect. And this is something that just blew my mind about six months ago, we all had our DNA anal analyzed and um, it told us what foods we needed to stay away from, where our blood sugar regulation was. Interesting enough, my one daughter was on a full ketogenic diet and that was the wrong thing for her because she can't uh, process fats very well. And I can't process fats very well. And I knew that I do really well on a high protein, low carb diet, but I don't add in a lot of extra fat. Mm -hmm. And that's where I do best. I'm allergic to avocado, which is, you know, keto favorite food. How do you do right? keto without avocado? Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> and um, then my other daughter, she is has a propensity to become insulin resistant. So she is a a great candidate for a full ketogenic diet. Um, so I, there's this tweaking and individuality that people really need to um, pay attention to and not, and then we can go into dirty keto and how you can do, you know, in, improve or uh, 
include all of the vegetable oils and canola oil that are extremely inflammatory and causing more disease than the sugar itself. Um, where do you see carnivore fitting into all of this? Oh, that's funny because, uh, you know, I was super skeptical of it at first. And I mean, this was maybe four or five years ago when it was really first starting to kind of hit the scene. But what was interesting, and, and so I, when I changed my diet to kind of low carb ketogenic, my digestive health improved a lot, but it was, was not perfect. Like I still had kind of intermittency with it. And uh, I actually noticed that if I did some Imodium, the stuff that folks usually take when they have like some traveler's diarrhea or something like that, like a two milligrams of Imodium in the morning and in the evening, like my, my poo was fantastic and I felt better, you know, and it, it was really interesting, but I was eating a lot of veggies, a lot of veggies because oh, man, veggies are good for you. Right. Well, I started seeing all of these folks. So I, I, I kind of, I developed the autoimmune paleo protocol. So in my first book, the paleo solution, I kind of laid out what this was and it's paleo at even a more stringent level. It's looking at things like tomatoes and potatoes and eggplants and, and, uh, different plants that have some fairly high immunogenic potential. Like they can irritate the immune system in, in some folks, uh, that's been helpful for some people, but it was really not, it was not a slam dunk. Like it, and it was really, really difficult to do. Like, uh, I kind of push back on the notion that most dietary approaches can produce a, a disordered eating, but man, it was, it was so onerous to do that thing. And I'm, I'm the developer of it, you know? So I was kind of like, wow, this, this is kind of a bummer. I wish it worked better. Like it helps some people. There's, a uh, six or eight randomized control or, or studies now that look at a, a autoimmune paleo diet. And it's beneficial for a, a host of different autoimmune and gut related diseases, but it's not, it's not like a knock it out of the park versus if somebody has type two diabetes and they just eat some sort of a low carb or ketogenic diet, they they're great. You know, they, they, they normalize their blood glucose levels, their risk for morbidity and mortality just improved dramatically. So this carnivore thing started getting on my radar. And what I noticed though, was that the people doing it had done everything and, yeah. and they, they weren't doing it for weight loss. Like the, the early iterations of carnivore, these people were, had horrible GI autoimmune and neurological co conditions like crushing depression, anxiety, um, really uh, complex interrelated problems. And what they reported is that they removed all plant material or most all plant material. And for some people, they ended up finding that they had to eat a specific cut of meat. This is what I call one cut carnivore. Like maybe it was ribeyes or maybe it was offal or, you know, whatever it was. But these people reported, reported just stunning improvements in their health. And yeah. you start, and you know, the evidence-based medicine folks will be like, well, that's just anecdote. That's just anecdote. And it's kind of like, well, geez, if I drop a hammer on that person's foot, that's also anecdotal, but <laughs> it, it, it's, it, you know, drop a hammer on your foot. It, it hurts. Well, that's anecdote. We need to, do we need to perform a randomized control trial around that? You know, I mean, some things, the efficacy is so obvious that it, it, yes, we do need to do studies. And I think that there are actually some, some carnivore studies that are in the pipeline now, but the long and short is that I was super impressed with what I was seeing from a clinical outcome perspective. And I was really intrigued because at that point, the people doing carnivore were doing it because they had turned over every other rock. And the last thing in the world that they wanted to do was to be down to eating just meat and like bone broth and bubbly water. But that was the only thing that they could do without being sick. And so I started really digging in and looking at like, can you develop nutrient deficiencies on carnivore? And I, I discovered, wow, it's really hard to do. Like there's not good literature that shows that you can develop a nutrient deficiency. But if you just eat bananas, if you just eat rice, if you just eat wheat, if you just eat a well-balanced, comprehensive vegan diet from every part of the plant world, you can develop nutrient deficiencies in pretty quick order, you know? So it was really interesting. And so uh, over the course of time, I don't eat 100% carnivore. I find that I do well with citrus fruits, Oddly enough, tomatoes I do great with, which are on this kind of no-no list, you know, because of the nightshade family. Um, 
avocados, artichokes, asparagus, nuts. I do pretty well with Brazil nuts and macadamias. I, I, I really don't do well with like almonds anymore. Um, and that's kind of what I, you know, what I've mapped out that I do pretty well with. So like different animal foods, I do pretty well with Greek yogurts and whatnot. And then the standard, you know, meat, poultry, uh, uh, seafood, all that type of stuff. So I, uh, I arrived at the carnivore idea, very skeptical, but what won me over was the the type of person that was doing it originally. Now I think people are using for weight loss and whatnot. And I, I guess that that's, that's fine, but, um, it's not the first place that I, it's not the first whistle stop I would make in dietary change. Like if you've been eating a standard American diet, why don't we just try cleaning up your food a little bit first? You know, let's try right. pulling sodas out of the mix first and and stuff like that. But for some people, it's interesting. They've reported that the carnivore is so satiating and so simple that it's great for them. And other, other people, I, I was this way initially um, when I was eating a standard ketogenic diet, um, kind of high protein ketogenic diet, but I had no food cravings. I, I had no, you know, I didn't feel like I was deprived at all. The first couple of times eating carnivore, like I went bananas, like I, I, I wanted ice cream. I wanted it. I wanted stuff that I never usually wanted. I was like, this is really weird. But what I figured out is I didn't need to be all or nothing with it. Like there were some plants that I did well with. And then honestly, over the course of time, my digestion has just gotten better and I feel better. So I've eased into that. And again, I know that's a long rambling answer, but that that's what I've got for you on that. Yeah. No, that's so similar to my experience. Um, and what I tell people is, you know, if you really, if we've done keto, you've done the cleanse, we've done a lot of gut healing, and you still want to pinpoint what vegetables might not be good for you. Yes, you can pay the money and do the DNA test that I did and get a spreadsheet of what foods you can eat and not eat. And by the way, I'm totally good with nightshades. I can eat tomatoes and eggplant and all of that. I cannot eat the cabbages, the broccoli, mm -hmm. the, the sulfur foods, or the oxalates, which include almonds and kale and spinach. So I was eating all the wrong vegetables. But before I did that test, what I did was just three days of carnivore. And then I would introduce a vegetable and see how my body reacted. So yep. that was a tool that I started to use, which I thought could be helpful for people as well. But we are, I can't believe how much time has passed. We're going to take a short commercial break, Rob, and be right back. Welcome back to Accelerated Health Radio and TV. I'm your host, Sarah Banta, the owner of Accelerated Health Products. And today we have Rob Wolf talking all things keto, paleo. And now I want to dive into your book, The Sacred Cow. And we were just talking about the carnivore diet, which obviously you need to eat meat, right? But then there's this whole um, <laughs> anti anti meat uh, group out there saying that, especially right now, I'm sure you're having a heyday with what's going on politically um, with the the plant based meat and the fake meat that they're trying to push on us. And to, it's just I. I'm trying to keep myself calm during this whole thing with all the external chaos going on, but let's dive into the ethics and the, I mean, we touched on the nutrient density of, of me, but let's get into the, the book, the sacred cow. Yeah. So uh, Diana and I have known since at least 2010 that we needed to do a, a book and we have both the book and film sacred cow. So if somebody's interested in this topic and right at the outset, um, uh, 
the book when we turned it in was 600 pages long. Uh, it got edited down to 300. Our editors did a great job. And I'll, I'll mention that the, uh, the publisher, Ben Bella, they're the same folks that published the China study. And they're the only mm -hmm. mainstream publisher that bit on this topic. And they bit because um, our, our proposal was so compelling to them. They said, if, if what you guys are suggesting here is true or even half true, the world really needs to know about this. And what we were putting forward is this idea that um, although we're being told that animal husbandry is the major driver of climate change and it's the thing that's going to destroy the planet, that it may actually be a super important tool for mitigating climate change and in, in producing food security around the whole world. And mm -hmm. Um, in a 20 or 30 minute block, I'm going to, I'm going to have a terrible time really unpacking that in a throwaway. So the thing that I would beg people is that I won't spin any emphatic statements like this is true. That's true. The other thing is true. What I beg people is to reserve a little bit of critical thinking on this. Don't believe me outright, but also don't dismiss me outright. Like check out the book, check out the film, uh, uh, follow the links and resources that we have in there because the the thing is, is it's a very complex, nuanced topic. We dig into the health, environmental, and ethical considerations of a meat-inclusive food system. And each one of those topics deserves a three or 400 page scientifically referenced book. And what we're trying to do is to put information in the hands of, of people that are not PhDs in ecology and thermodynamics and whatnot to be able to, to have a fighting chance of understanding this. So I don't know if I helped or hurt my case there, but that's <laughs> at the outset, that's kind of the, the things that we had to talk about. I had my first public debate around, uh, grass centric animal husbandry at California State University Chico in 2006 so there was a a group of kind of kind of vegan folks that were you know wanted this debate talking about the the negative impacts um health wise environmentally and also the ethics of consuming meat and then there were somehow I got included in this as as were uh, folks from the Department of Agriculture there at uh, CSU Chico and uh, Chico State is a savory institute hub. So uh, Alan Savory founded this holistic management kind of approach to raising grazing animals. And what the research on that material suggests that what they are doing actually returns desertified areas to natural grassland habitat, that it improves carbon sequestration, that these grasslands retain huge amounts of water when water falls on the earth. And this is in pretty stark contrast to mm -hmm. the industrial row crop food system, which it, it's ironic. Folks will say, you know, can you scale a regenerative process? And and I, I think that the simple answer is yes. The the honest answer is more complex than that. But everybody agrees that our current industrial row crop food system has an expiration date on it. We've lost nearly two thirds of the topsoil in our, our farmlands. And once that's gone, it's gone. And you can't grow meat in a lab or fake meats without industrial row crop food systems. This is something that just makes me crazy. The meat doesn't just magically appear in the lab. You have to feed it stuff and the stuff <laughs> you feed is processed grains and legumes and, and, things like that. Like it's, it's really kind of interesting when I talk about this stuff to children, like at, at, at elementary schools, the kids get it immediately. They're like, oh yeah, like something needs to grow to feed this thing. And when I talk to adults, it's, it's really weird because people are like, well, wait a second. I mean, where do carrots come right now? Don't they come from like a greenhouse? And you're just kind of like, oh my goodness, <laughs> doomed, you know, we, we are totally doomed. So, um, I mean, that, again, it, it's so complex. I don't know if you have some really targeted things you want me to dig into or. Well, just uh, just in general, the number one, the nutrient density of meat versus a plant based diet, but also all of the vegans arguments um, against eating meat for ethical reasons. Yeah, so it's it's interesting when we when we started the book initially, we were going to tackle the ethical topic. But then as we started developing the book, what was interesting, and, and again, I'm giving a very superficial 
treatment of this. So I'm going to kind of say it in a, a somewhat emphatic way, but I, 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 if we had three hours, I would go through and detail and cite references and build a more scientific case. But when we consider human health, it is hard bordering on impossible to feed a human being adequately without animal products, particularly for children and uh, pregnant moms and, and developing fetuses. Like the, the research on nutrient deficiencies and really significant health problems uh, from, from vegan and vegetarian diets is remarkable. So if it's, and, and I mean, it, there was a, a recent study looking at vegan families in Finland and 85% of them had uh, nutrient deficiencies, zinc, iron, uh, omega-3s that were significant enough to impair cognitive function and, and immune health and, and overall development. And this is in a, a group, this is in a, a population that earns on average $200,000 a year, has on average master's degree educations, and they mm-hmm. still can't make this stuff work. And, and so, and this is supposed to be something that we just push out to the masses, people who are living at the margins and, uh, you know, don't have access to, um, to, you know, outstanding nutritional supplements and everything. Like it it was kind of jaw dropping how widespread the new nutrient deficiencies were there. So if it's, let's just assume for a minute that what I'm saying is true, that it's very, very hard to grow human beings adequately, healthfully without animal products, then where are the ethics on the animal product? Like that changes the ethical story a little bit. Like, you know, I, I, um, I'm not particularly religious, but I do believe that human beings, although I, I just think human beings are the most important organism on the planet. I don't say that as we should destroy and crush and victimize everything else, but I, I hold humanity in a, a layer above and, and, uh, maybe I'm a horrible human being for that, but I, I just do. And so when we start talking about ethics, then I think it's ethically very important to provide the opportunity for people to feed themselves and their children in a way that they're going to be successful and healthy. So let's just kind of like, you know, there's that thing. And then on the, um, the environmental side, when we really dig into the book, it looks like it's impossible to have a food system without animal husbandry that is sustainable over the course of thousands of years, hundreds or thousands of years. Like it's literally the only other option that we have is the industrial row crop food system, which is we know has an expiration date on it. Mm -hmm. So if you can't grow humans healthily without animal husbandry, and if you can't have a food system, healthy land, healthy soils without the interplay of animals, then it really changes the ethical consideration there. And the main ethical pushback, it, it, animals have been treated poorly in the past. And honestly, I would say that um, chickens and pork are kind of a different category because they are raised exclusively in kind of a confined area feedlot scenario and they're only fed grains and legumes and their their environment is is pretty terrible. But ironically, what we've been told time and again is to eat less beef and more chicken and pork. Yeah. But beef spends, even CAFO, like Walmart beef, spends 70 to 80% of its life on grass. And so it would be a fairly, and, and even beyond that, of the food that is eaten by CAFO cattle is inedible by humans. They take Mm -hmm. the, these cows and after they harvest a wheat field or a corn field or what have you, the cows go through and eat all the crop residue and they pee and poo and renutrify the soil. And that is actually heading towards kind of a regenerative type model. So, you know, if we treat animals better, which we absolutely can, and we absolutely should, Um, And then we consider how much death and destruction occurs due to the industrial row crop food system. These giant combines going through a field kill millions of animals, billions of insects, herbicides, pesticides. You would not believe the number of rodents that are killed because we have to put a, a chemical pesticides in these grain silos. Otherwise the mice and, and other rodents would eat all of it. So the, and oftentimes the vegan folks will say, well, I didn't, my intention is not to kill them. And I, I find that to be a, a super unethical, uh, a dodgy cop out, you know, right. where, and 
if you are drunk and you didn't intend to hit the school bus full of children, that doesn't matter. You still were drunk and you hit the school bus full of children. Like intentionality is not some sort of like metaphysical get out of jail free card. It's ridiculous. And so when we consider how many animals, how many, how much death is caused by the industrial row crop food system and actually compare it to what happens in a regenerative agriculture system. There's a paper from the University of Oregon that com it's called the least harm principle where they they posit that, okay, we should cause the least death, the least suffering. What food system does that? And interestingly, the, the study suggests that a grass centric model with grazing animals, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds causes the least harm, the least death, the least suffering of any food system. And what does that look like? It looks like kind of a paleo esque whole foods based diet. So again, I know that that was like a, a absolute, like uh, almost a drive by mugging, trying to explain <laughs> all of that stuff, but those are kind of the, the big pieces. So if, if folks have concerns around the ethical considerations of their food and they should, I would just encourage them to uh, leave some space in their psyche that the standard narrative coming from the government, from the media, from social media may not be on point and that there may be a lot more to this story than what they're, they're giving credit. And if we really are concerned about uh, uh, social justice topics, uh, uh, climate change, all these different things, then it really behooves us to take some time and make sure that what we're being fed at the the kind of institutional level is accurate. Because if it's not, yeah. then we're doing the wrong things to try to address these problems. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe I'm ridiculously out to lunch, but who knows, even if 20% of what I put forward is accurate, that 20% needs to be woven into our policy and, and what we're doing going forward. Well, just that statement you could take across all boards of fake news and what we're being fed in general, not just in this on this topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But two, two things I want to touch on is that something that I learned was the chicken. I don't eat chicken. I it didn't really feel good for me, but then I found out why is that they're full of amyloid proteins that your bo body can't break down and then reuse. And so I stay away from chicken and I. I tend towards the wild meats, the bison, the elk, the deer, um, grass fed beef. That's what I do the best on wild fish. And um, whenever I have someone that comes to me with uh, on a vegan diet, they're hell bent on it, but they're coming to me with arthritic pain and high blood sugar and all these chronic diseases. And I try to you know, soften the blow as far as if you just introduce a little bit of protein, because your body needs those amino acids to tell the brain, I'm full, I'm satiated, I'm getting what I need. And if I even if I go for a couple of days on a quote unquote, vegan diet, my system is just destroyed. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just interesting how it all plays in. And, and then you wonder, well, if that's what my body's telling me, and that's human nature, then why would the world be set up in a way where eating meat is a bad thing? So anyways, I, we are, I can't believe we're almost out of time and we might need to have this you on again, Rob, to get really into the detail of all this. But before we go, can you tell people where they can find you and where they can find your book to get a deeper understanding of this topic? Yeah. So sacredcow.info, you can find the book and the film. And for some people, the film is just the place to jump in. It, it tells the same story, but in a film format, uh, the book is, I think, very readable, very accessible, but it's almost like a, uh, a, a murder case where you, you, you know, here's what, what the, the claims are. And then we, we go through and, and try to look at all the, the, the data and claims from there. Uh, robwolf.com is the other main spot. You can find the Healthy Rebellion, which is the community that we have, and Healthy Rebellion Radio, which is the weekly Q&A podcast that I do with my wife. And it's fantastic. You guys subscribe to his channel. I love listening to it weekly. I've been following Rob for years and years and years. He's been amazing. And he's been at the forefront of all of this. And I've learned so much from you, Rob. So thank you for that. And thanks Jonah, for thank joining you. us today. And we will definitely have you back on to dive deeper into this topic. Great, um, thank you. 
Thank you everyone for joining us today. And if I can help you with your health issues, you can contact me directly through the website or at Sarah at Accelerated Health Pro products.com and I'm happy to put together a personalized protocol for you. And if you're in, interested in joining the free group coaching that comes with the Ascent Diet Cleanse, leave a comment below and I'm happy to help and discuss your personal issues and how this can help you. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram under Accelerated Health Products and my YouTube channel and all podcast platforms. This is um, broadcasted over 100 channels under Accelerated Health Radio and TV. And you can find it on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, Pandora, or whatever podcast platform you subscribe to. I also do Accelerated Health Bites, where I do short informational videos on health topics and solutions that you ask me about. Join us every week at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And you can also use coupon W4HC20 for 20% off site wide. Thanks again for joining us on Accelerated Health Radio and TV and have a great week.